This really nice demonstration video came out recently where a group at Tübingen University got an industrial robot to play table tennis. What grabbed a lot of people's attention, I think, is that they're using reinforcement learning. We're used to seeing RL do quite impressive things in simulation, but getting these methods to work in the real world is still quite challenging. Being both a table tennis player and AI researcher myself, I spent some time reading up on the project to understand the technical details of it, and in this video I'm going to summarise how it all works. To be clear, I was not part of this project, so this video is more like a paper review. Now, there are actually two other important papers from the same lab that came out in 2019 that form the basis for the system, which the recent paper then builds on. So my description will cover elements from all these papers. I'll start off giving a quick overview of the whole system and then dive into detail on the RL component. Here's a top-down view. So we have a human on one side and our robot on the other. Now, right off, there are a couple of simplifications made by the system. Firstly, it is trained to try to return the ball to a fixed target location in the middle of the table. So there are no tactics going on, like trying to hit it where the human can't return it. The aim seems to be to build a cooperative robot that you could have a continual rally with. Another simplification comes in the form of a hitting plane. They require that the robot contacts the ball wherever the ball intersects this plane. So effectively always hitting the ball at a fixed X position. This simplifies things because it doesn't worry about whether to move forwards towards the net or back away from the table to hit the ball. The first step of the pipeline is to detect where the ball is in the camera image. They do this with some fairly basic image processing, subtracting one frame from an earlier frame. So since the ball is the main thing that moves between the images, uh, this is what shows up in that subtraction. They then apply some color thresholding and basic cleaning rules. And the result is this small white blob wherever the ball is in the image. The second step of the pipeline is to convert from these 2D coordinates within the camera image to 3D coordinates in the real world. To do this, you need at least two cameras so you can triangulate the location. And this is done by solving some linear algebra described in the first paper in the series. Let's imagine we've now collected the XYZ coordinates of the ball over four time steps. The next thing to do is predict the trajectory of the ball. This allows the robot to know where to move to in order to hit the ball. The trajectory is predicted using a straightforward curve fitting approach. Specifically, they fit a quadratic equation for each axis, and this can then just be extrapolated forward to find where it intersects the hitting plane, which will be the hitting point. It's important to also predict the spin on the ball at the hitting point. So in table tennis, a different spin direction on the ball will require a very different kind of shot. The authors actually have an entire paper dedicated to developing different methods to detect the spin. For example, they explore using some high-speed cameras to estimate how far the label on the ball has rotated in between frames. But the method that is ultimately chosen is much simpler. First, consider a trajectory without any spin. Um, now imagine the same initial velocity on the ball, but with heavy topspin. The spin actually creates this new force pulling the ball downwards. This is known as the Magnus effect. Now, by tracking the trajectory of the ball, which, by the way, the system is already doing, uh, you can actually come up with an estimate of this Magnus force, and you can then work backwards to figure out the spin that generated that force. Once the position, velocity, and spin at the hitting point is known, some standard robotic planning methods can be used to move the robot over to that hitting point. Notice that no learning has happened in the pipeline so far. It's a collection of well-engineered, rules-based subsystems that are fitted together. But this changes in the final step of the pipeline. As well as physically moving the bat to the hitting point, the more interesting thing perhaps that the robot needs to do is decide what type of shot to play, like how hard should it hit the ball and the angles to position the bat. And this is then something that they learn through reinforcement learning. Specifically, the RL component selects what type of shot to make, although this is still executed 
through a rules-based robotic planner. It's important to contrast this with what happens, for example, in Mujoko environments. There, we are usually trying to learn the entire pipeline from observations to making the motor movements in the robot, and that's not quite happening here. So let's break down how this is framed as a reinforcement learning problem. Each episode only has one time step, which consists of a single hit and direct feedback based on the accuracy of that hit. The action space has three continuous parameters to set, so the horizontal velocity to hit the ball with, and then two different bat angles. Now, in table tennis, you might also want to have control over the Z and Y velocities, but they ignore that here to simplify things a bit. The reward function has three components. The first and second are the distance between the target bounce position compared to the actual bounce position, uh, both in the X and Y directions. And then they also want the ball to be as low as possible over the net. So this avoids, I guess, the robot doing like a high arcing return that might be safe, but not very fun to play against. The rewards are then all zero if the ball doesn't bounce on the opponent's side of the table. More formally, this is interpreted as a one-step Markov decision process or a contextual bandit problem. Usually with sequential MDPs, we worry about transition functions and discount factors, but here they go away because it's only one time step. I've shown on the slide how these MDP elements map to the concrete things that we've discussed. Now we have the problem framed, uh, you can just plug in whatever your favorite RL algorithm is. In the paper, they try out a bunch of popular methods. One slightly unusual thing they do that helps a little is separating out the Q values. So they're actually predicting three Q values simultaneously rather than a single one as you would usually do. To be honest, I didn't really follow the rationale for why this helps, but they say it gives a small performance boost empirically. DDPG and TD3 are the algorithms they find work best. These algorithms are both very similar to each other. TD3 is just a slight modification or adaption of DDPG. Both are actor critic methods. Um, they use separate networks for both the actor and the critic. The actor or policy network takes as input the state and directly predicts what actions the agent should do. It actually uses the critic network within its loss function to learn to take better actions in future. The critic network takes in a state and action and outputs a Q value representing how good that state and action pairing is. Since this is a one step problem, the Q value is actually just the expected reward. Um, and this is minimized with mean squared error. So there's no bootstrapping using, using the Bellman equation like you usually see. Nothing too fancy going on with the architectures. Both networks have two layers of 256 hidden neurons, uh, all with value activations. Then for the action network, the outputs are bounded uh, using the TANH activation since the action space is bounded. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of the paper is that this all works in the real world. Now, they do actually perform most of the training in a simulator and just do some fine tuning in the real world. But they make a big effort to get this simulator to closely match what happens in the real world. For example, they set the friction coefficients of the ball and the bat to match those that they are actually using. The key insight that explains why the sim to real process is so smooth, I think, is that the input to the reinforcement learning component doesn't really change regardless of whether this is running in the simulator or the real world. So in the simulator, you directly have access to the ball position, whereas in the real world, we need to do the image processing and triangulation steps first. But after that point, the pipeline is basically the same for both. The reason they still need to do some fine tuning is to adapt to any small changes experienced in the real world. For example, maybe there's a slight breeze in the lab or the table is not perfectly level. To summarize, I think there are three things that make RL work in the real world here. Firstly, RL is only a small part of the system. 
They're not trying to learn from pixels all the way to joint movements. Secondly, they've removed the sequential aspect of RL. Uh, so this avoids uh, any challenges around sparse rewards or in exploring the environment thoroughly. And then lastly, the simulated pipeline is very close to that in the real world. So that's my overview of this project. I'm really looking forward to see what they do in the next version of the robot. If they will try to learn more of the pipeline, if they'll push it towards playing more competitively or develop it as more of a coaching robot. Uh, do share your own thoughts in the comments. I will be making more of these types of videos in future where I explain recent research in AI, robotics and reinforcement learning. So subscribe if you want to be notified of these in the future.